So get your Bibles now and go with me to Revelation chapter 3 and look, if you will, please, at uh, verse 14. We're going to read down through verse 22 in the end of the chapter. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for the privilege to read from the Word of God. I thank you that it's quick and powerful. I thank you that, God, it has a word for every person that's here. God, you know who we are. You know where we're at. You know the very needs of every life. And, God, I pray today as your messenger, I pray today, God, as your preacher, that, God, you'd anoint this word. And I pray that, God, today we'd walk out here knowing we've not just sung a song or heard a sermon, but I pray, God, we'd walk out here knowing we've heard from you. For that somebody who needs to be saved, may this be the day they meet Jesus Christ. For that somebody who's grown cold or indifferent, as our text said, they've grown lukewarm, then, God, today, I pray you'd shake them, speak to them, show them that, God, you have a better and a greater plan for their life. God, I come to you now in Jesus' mighty name, and I commit this service, commit this sermon to you, and I ask your blessings upon it. Because it's in Jesus' name that we do pray. And good and loud now, everybody said. When you come to Revelation 2 and 3, there are seven churches that are being written to the seven churches that are there in what is known as Asia Minor. And when you study these churches, you're reminded every time that these are the churches that Jesus Christ uh, bought with his blood. The Bible said in Ephesians 5 and verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And then it says, and gave himself for it. You see, Jesus loves the church. He is the high priest. He is the high shepherd. He is the great shepherd of the church. When you come to church, it's not about Clark. It's not about a song. It's not about whether you sit just right in the right pew. Hey, when you come to church, church is about Jesus Christ. So when you come to God's house, You've got to know that God magnifies, magnifies his house. He, he honors his house. He reverences his house. His house matters. That's why the Bible tells us over and over again that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Well, you get these seven different letters. The first one was written to the church at Ephesus. When you read about Ephesus, you'll find out they had all kinds of amazing things going on, all kinds of culture, all kinds of relevance, all kinds of things that were happening in their culture. They were greatly educated, but something happened. And that is that the church at Ephesus lost their first love. I mean, man, they were blowing and going. They had revivals. They had vacation Bible schools. People were being saved and baptized. God was moving in a mighty way, but the Bible said that they utterly forsook Jesus Christ. You see, you can be busy about good things and busy about even godly things, but, oh, friend, you and I are called to love the Lord thy God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our minds. But you see, a church that was busy, but they didn't love Jesus. Then you come to the second church, which was the church of Smyrna, which represents the danger of the fear of suffering. 
I, I know we're living in 2022 and I know we've got things going on all around us. I, I know you're hearing things on the news. We've got a world that I'm telling you is absolutely terrified. The Bible said in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, it says that, uh, that fear is a spirit. And I want you to know every time you turn on your television, every time you turn on your radio, when you read the paper, I promise you someone is trying to pass out fear to you. But I tell you, we've not been given the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. But you read the rest of the story where the Bible says you and I are to endure persecution. Hey, the Bible tells us all you who live God in Christ Jesus, it says you're gonna suffer persecution. The Bible said to endure hardness as a good soldier, Jesus Christ. Hey, we're living in the day and time that is right before the return of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, persecution is on the way around the world. We get letters from missionaries. We, we get letters from evangelists who are flaming evangelists, who are on fire for God. Man, they're doing amazing things. Multitudes are being saved. And then they'll get a church started and they'll burn that church down and they'll shoot that pastor. They'll shoot that missionary. Hey, that persecution like that has not come to America, but I think one day it will. Then you gotta ask yourself the question when you read about the third church because it's a church at Pergamos, which illustrates the constant danger that they were under because they had doctrinal divide. They had doctrinal compromise. Hey, the Bible says to endure sound doctrine. Somebody is right concerning the word of God. That's why the Bible says you and I are not to heap to ourselves teachers having itching ears. You and I are to stand up with a clarion call and we are to declare a thus saith the Lord. Hey, somebody is right and I want you to know that somebody who is right is God himself. If you want to know what God thinks, all you have to do is look into his word. God is right. Doctrine is right. I heard a charismatic preacher the other day saying that doctrines divide. No, no, no. Doctrines do not divide. Doctrines bring us together because it's according to the word of God. So then you have a fourth church. And it's a church at, uh, at Thyatira. It's a church at Pergamos. Then we have the church at Sardis, which is a warning in Sardis against the warning, against the, the danger of spiritual deadness. Spiritual deadness. You can be saved and be dead spiritually. Hey, you can be saved and not even be in your Bible. Hey, you can be saved and not be a man or woman of prayer. Hey, you can be saved and the house of God's not a priority to your life. You can be saved you can say, man, I believe in heaven, I believe in hell. And never talk to anyone about their soul or about even coming to church. You look back at that church, you'll find out that Ephesus lost its first love. Smyrna uh, represents the fact that they were suffering and they, they, were, they were afraid of that suffering. And then you had Pergamos, which illustrates the constant danger of doctrinal compromise. Then you had Thyatira, which was monumental to the fact that moral compromise had come. And now you come to Sardis and the warning is against spiritual deadness. You and I are called to be alive in Jesus Christ. But then there's the church of Philadelphia which was exhorted to keep enduring with patience because they had little strength, but the Bible said they were waiting on the return of Jesus Christ. It's really the only church where they get anything positive. But then you come to our church, which is the church at Laodicea. You see, they were lukewarm. You see, they were self-sufficient. They, they were unconscious of the desperate fact that they spiritually needed the Lord Jesus then more than they had ever needed him before. You see, I'm not much of a dispensationalist. But there are those who say these seven churches represent the seven dispensations. And when you come to the last one, which is the church of Laodicea, they are right before the return of Jesus. You say, Clark, where are we at as far as the Willow Park Baptist Church is at? I tell you where we're at. We're right before the return of Jesus Christ. Israel's back in the land. There's a prophetic time clock ticking. There ought to be an urgency today that heaven and hell are real, that Jesus is coming. You see the church at Laodicea. The Bible said this in verse 17. It says, thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and, and knowest not. Did you get that phrase? And knowest not. You don't even know it, that you're wretched and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. When you read this, this was a church that was a functioning church. They, they were a busy church. 
But they were so full of themselves. They, they were so in love with themselves that they couldn't grasp where they were at. It's a dangerous thing for Christians. It's a dangerous thing for churches to be so full of ourselves that we forget what our real mission is. They say of great coaches that they scout their own teams. Years ago, Dean Smith, who was a, a great basketball coach at, at North Carolina, would, would pay coaches that had retired, and they would go into every one of his games. He'd have two or three coaches up there, and they'd be scouting. And he'd get that scouting report to know what was weak and know where their weaknesses were at and know what they needed to work on. You see, when you look at Laodicea, there was more than just a retired coach talking to them. The Lord Jesus was scouting them. You see, they'll know us not. You see, there are those that are in this building today. And you're on your way out into eternity and you've never been saved and you don't know it. One of the sad realities of the world we're in is that everybody thinks they're going to heaven. We sing the song when we all get to heaven. But if I read my Bible right, there's gonna come a day when they say, but Lord, did not we prophesy? But Lord, did not we do many mighty miracles? But Lord, did not we cast out devils? I mean, you talk about looking good. And the Lord Jesus is going to look at him and say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And here's the problem. I never knew you. I mean, if, if, our, if our president came walking in the room, I could say, man, that's Joe Biden. I know the president. And, and I could say, man, I know who he is. I know he's from up there in that area by uh, Pennsylvania. Did he grow up in Scranton? I could tell you a lot about him. But here's the thing. I know about him, but I don't know him. If Dak Prescott came walking in here, I would tell him he better win today. Can I get an amen? But I know about him, but I don't know him. And I think there's going to be a lot of people standing at that day when there's not going to be another chance. And they're going to hear Jesus, who is the author of life, Jesus, Jesus, who is the giver of abundant life, Jesus, who is the giver of eternal life. They're going to hear Jesus say, depart from me, ye that knew iniquity, because I never knew you. You see, you go to the modern church. I, I, read, I, I quoted to you at the first or the last of last year, and that is 95% of churches in America, according to statistics, will never hear the word hell. I mean, all year long, their preachers, their, their Sunday school teachers, their curriculum, nobody will talk about hell. Can I tell you if there is a heaven, there is a hell. And the, the question is, have you examined yourself? 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, let every man and let every woman examine themselves whether they be in the faith. You see, thou knowest not. You see, there's a responsibility of the saved. You see, you and I have a responsibility. I said we have a responsibility. C can you imagine? Can you imagine if I had the cure for COVID? They'd probably knock me out. Can I just tell you that? Amen. But can you imagine if I honestly had the cure for COVID? And your loved one was laying on that bed and they were gasping for air and, and I said, well, I, I had the cure for, for COVID. But I'm too busy. I, I've got other things to do. Hey, I've got people I like more than your family. Hey, I'm just going to keep this from my family. Can you imagine what that would be? Can you imagine the national outcry? Well, I want to tell you something. We have a greater than a cure for COVID. We have the cure for eternal life. How tragic that we as Christians or we as a church wouldn't share that. I mean, we really, I mean, we have the answer. Go therefore into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Do you know the only thing that Jesus ever prayed for? He prayed that there would be more laborers. Can I tell you, when you get saved, you don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be an evangelist. You don't have to be a missionary. As a believer, you are a witness to the good news of Jesus Christ. Thou knowest not. You see, the mission of the church is not to make everybody happy. The mission of the church is not to entertain you. Hey, if you're single, this is not a singles bar. Come on. But you know what our mission is? To tell the world that Jesus saves. The Kiwanis are not going to do that. 
The Lions Club's not going to do that. Hey, hey, colleges and universities are not going to do that. They're going to be the opposite of that. The one group that has the answer is us. Somebody says, you think you're right? No, I know I'm right. And I know I know I'm right because I'm right according to the word of God. That's how I know. You see, they'll know us not. They'll know us not that, hey, 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 we're living, we're living right before the return of Jesus. Every time I pick up my paper, every time I read something on Fox News or read one of those news information blogs, the, the heralds stand up on my arms. Why? Because there's Russia standing out there and they're on the border of Ukraine. What does that mean? I don't know. Hey, what do I know? I know that a month ago that Russia and China were doing joint military drills together. You say, what does that mean? I don't know, but I'll tell you this, that one day coming from the east is going to be China and Russia and they're going to walk down the Tigris River and they're going to walk into the valley of Megiddo and hey, the whole world's going to go in flux. You know why? Because they're going to come after Israel. We could have understood that 50 years ago, 100 years ago, but I promise you, it's happening right now. And you say, what is it? It's pointing towards the fact that Jesus is coming back. And thou knowest not. Listen, today, 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 I want to give you three words of advice from what John gives us to the church at Laodicea. Very quickly, if you will, look at verse 14. Because in verse 14, he talks about the Lord's complaint. Verse 14, he says, under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right? Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The angel, the angel. You see, there's a lot of debate about that angel. I've got a dear friend that says that angel without equivocation is without any doubt whatsoever. That angel is a pastor or a messenger. I don't know if that's true because all through the Bible you get the idea that there's angels and angels are real. The Bible says to entertain strangers because you might be entertaining an angel unaware. So I'm not sure, but I'll just tell you this. Many people think that angel is a pastor. And let me tell you what I know about churches and pastors. I know this, that the degree or temperature of the church is not going to be one degree different from the pastor. If the pastor is dead, the church is dead. There is no wondering about that. Here he is. He gives a word to the pastor. I think today, I think today that God's given your pastor a word. And look what he goes on to say in verse 14. He says, under the angel church of the layout of sins, right? These things said the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation. The amen means he has the final word. When we get done, CNN and Fox News do not have the final word. God does. And then he says he is a faithful and true witness. That means he's immutable. That means he will not lie. Numbers 23 and 19, God's not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? Can I tell you, if you read it in God's word, it is true today. And then he talked about the beginning of creation. Look at it. Parents, look at me. Grandparents, get this. It's in God's word for a reason. The beginning of creation. If you go somewhere to a school, a university, or a church, and they refuse to tell you that God is creator, get out of there. Why? The very first word in Genesis 1-1, first verse in the first book of the Bible, says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you raise a kid to think that one day they were amoeba that turned into a tadpole to a monkey to your grandma, you're going to raise a kid that's nuts. Come on, amen. Listen to what the Bible says in Psalms 139 verse 14. It says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made and that my soul knoweth right well. You, your kids, everybody you know is created by God. Amen. I just got throwing this in there. It's not in my notes, but it's free. Come on, amen. I haven't preached in three weeks, so hang on, all right? But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Listen to me. Here's the deal. If you and I say we believe in an evolutionary process, if you and I believe that there's divine change, that there's a dilemma about that, then here's what I want you to do. And I want you to call me. I'll give you my number. When you go out the door, I'll give you my cell number. And here's what I want you to do. If you believe in intelligent design, if you believe we evolved over time, I want you to go sit over there at the Fort Worth Zoo, and when that monkey becomes a girl, call me. You know why that's never going to happen? Because it has never happened. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Did you get what he just said? The Lord gives a complaint. He says, I'm the beginning of creation. 
Then verse 15 and 16, he says something. He said, I know thy works. If I say works, oh, you're going to like this. Because I was looking it up in the, uh, in the Greek, which is the original language for the New Testament. And as I looked it up, I looked up that word works. And here's what it says in the Strong's King James Concordance of the, of the Greek language. It says this, works, an obsolete word meaning to work. We want something for nothing. You live in a handout world. You work until July to pay somebody else's bills. You don't amen me. I'm coming down there to amen myself. Amen. You know why your property taxes are so high? Because they got people living over there in government-run houses that don't pay anything. Hey, 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 let me tell you something. Work is in the Bible. Last time I checked, the Bible said if you don't work, you don't eat. You may not have liked to hear it, but I sure enjoyed saying it. Can I just tell you, amen, yes. So talking about their complaint. Then look at what he goes on to say. He talks about they were lukewarm in verses 15 and 16. You see, they had a tri-cities area. They had Colossae. They had Herapolis. Colossae had cold water. Herapolis had hot springs. And when they put them in pipes and sent them over there to Laodicea, they would become lukewarm. And the lukewarm was difficult to deal with. Hey, you don't mind if it's hot. You don't mind if it's cold. But you don't want it lukewarm. Huh. And you know what's so sad about that church? That church was a representation of Jesus. This church is a representation of Jesus. And you know what's sad about the church at Laodicea? They were representing a Savior who's not a lukewarm Savior. And boy, it's easy to barbecue Laodicea. But I want to tell you something, Willow Park Baptist Church. We don't represent a lukewarm Savior. How do you get lukewarm? Well, if, if you read it right, thou knowest not that thou art wretched and you're miserable and you're poor and you're blind and you're naked. I, I, I want to tell you something. I, I, you don't need to say amen here. You're in a blessed church. Last year, we had the greatest year we've ever had. Last year we gave, the, we gave, listen, last year between all of our giving, you gave $10.7 million. Last year you as a church gave $1,718,189 to World Missions. For every dollar we spend here, we give $3 away. For, for every staffing. Hey, hey, and let me just tell you, we've seen more saved, we've seen more baptized than we've ever seen in the history of our church. And I say amen. But I want to tell you what the danger is. We got this building, and may I say, when we get in that building, I'm praying it's going to be paid for. Amen. But I'm just saying this. It'd be easy. Say, so check us out. Look at here. Look at what we've done. I want to tell you the day we do that, we're wretched, we're miserable, we're poor, we're blind, and we're naked. Wait, wait, look at me. I hope you got your big boy pants on because here it comes. Come on, amen. You know how churches become Laodicean churches? You know how Christians become Laodicean Christians, you know how your walk with God becomes a Laodicean walk with God? I'll tell you how. You get casual. The word casual is a root word for casualty. You stop minding your marriage and somebody else will come in there and take care of your wife. You don't 
oversee and take care of your kids, somebody else will be telling them what to do. You get casual. Hey, I'm, I'm talking to us as a church. I, I, man, the, what I just told you, I've been praying for. Praise God what God, but I want to tell you something. It'd be easy to get casual. It'd be easy to say, hey, man, look at that building. Whoo, check that out. I mean, it'd be easy to come in here and say, hey, they don't need me. They're, they're big enough. For, no, 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 no. What happened to the church at Laodicea? They got casual. There was a complaint. Very quickly, verse 17 through 19, the Bible said the Lord gave them counsel. counsel. He says, because thou sayest and knowest not that thou art wretched and increased with goods and have no need of nothing. He said, you're wretched. That means you're distrusted. It means you're pitiful and miserable. It means you're delusional and poor. It means you saw nothing really clearly because you're blind. It means you're naked. You stripped away everything. And here you are. And look at what verse 18 says. It says, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire. Look at me. Look at me. We, we spend all of our time worrying about our house and worrying about this. And, and, and we get our priorities out of whack. I want to tell you, when you stand before God, he's not going to ask you how big your house was or what you were wearing. He's going to ask you what you did for him. That's not just for me as a pastor. That's not just for evangelists and missionaries. Hey, what do you do? He, he's looking at works. You say, well, you don't go to heaven by your works. No, praise God, because we couldn't get there if we did. But I want to tell you something. Lukewarm churches, lukewarm families, and lukewarm Christians, they get their priorities wrong. Hey, look at me. I love ball. You say, how could I not love ball? I root for the Kansas Jayhawks. Can I get an amen right there? Yes. I'm hoping the Cowboys win tonight. Amen. Somebody say, now, preacher, you're preaching that tonight. Can you run a tape of that? No, I'm not running a tape of it because if you're not here, I'm not going to let you hear it. Come on, Amen. Somebody said, the Cowboys are playing. Hey, look at me. They hadn't played in 30 years. <laughs> Come on, set your DVR. Don't become casual. Don't become lukewarm. Don't become indifferent. Verse 19, look at this. I love this. It says, as many as I love. Everybody say love. Say it again. Say love. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. You know what that means? That means I was the greatly loved child of Joyce Bozier. Can I get an amen? Yes. My mother would reach for a roll at Thanksgiving and we would duck thinking she's going to slap us. Come on, can I get an amen? How many of you see kids at the Walmart and you're thinking, I'd like to resurrect my mama so he could wear, or my mama could wear that kid out? How many of you know he is? As many as I love, I rebuke and chase him. You know what that word rebuke means? It means you verbally say something. You know what that word chasing means? It means you give them correction. Everybody in here that's ever been on a team knows the difference between a rebuke and chasing. Because you had a coach, hey, hey, they've lit you up. Why didn't you do this? And why weren't you in your spot? They've let you have it. They've rebuked you. And by the way, parents, your kids still ought to get rebuked. Yeah, man. Don't kill them. But you know what chasing is? is when you have a coach that tells you what you're doing wrong, why you're doing it wrong, and how to do it right. Your best coach didn't just chew you out. Your best coach told you how you could be better. And if you've ever been around a good coach, they made you better. Your life is better right now because they instructed you. Hey, they, they, they gave you a rebuke, but they chastened your life. You see, you have the Lord's complaint. You have the Lord's counsel. Now listen to this in verse 20. He says, I give you a call. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I have overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Hey, uh, I was at a youth camp. And I preached out of Hebrews chapter 12. And I got the verses right here. I want to read it to you. It says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he of whom the Father chasteneth not? But here it is. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. I preached that. And a group of kids got to 
drinking a Coke afterwards, and I'm walking through the camp, and they surrounded me. They said, Preacher, if we got this right, you, you were telling us that God loves us, and because God loves us, he corrects us. I said, that's exactly right. God doesn't, God, God's not trying to be mean. God's got a plan. God's got order. God, God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to have an abundant life. And a part of that is he has to correct you sometimes. And you, they said, you said, but if you be without chastisement, that you're illegitimate. And I heard these kids say, my parents don't care when I come in. My parents don't care where I go. I go to prom. And they never say, how'd it go? What'd you do? And you know what we figured out, preacher? They don't care. I'm, I'm going to say this in two minutes, I'm going to be done. But listen, you live in a world where they're fixing to start putting people in jail because they're a witness for Jesus. It's called proselyting laws. And by the way, they do it all around the world. You're one of the free places where you can actually talk to somebody about God. But I want to ask you something. Who have you talked to this week? I mean, really, who would you invite today? Who's sitting beside you that needs Jesus? Who's sitting beside you that needs some rebuking and chastening? Where are they at? I know it's cold. I, I know we got COVID going on. But I want to ask, well, who would you talk to this week about Jesus? Who would you get to the house of God? And I'm not trying to put you, but here's what I want to challenge you as your pastor. You remember the angel, the messenger, the pastor? I want to give you this. We have, we have a dear member of our church, Dr. Tim Lee. He's an evangelist. He lost both his legs in Vietnam. He's written his story in a track called The Day My Running Stopped. I've only had this out of the thousands and thousands of times. I've given that track to somebody. I've only had it thrown down one time. In the back of it, there's the, 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 the prayer that you pray when you want to come to faith to Jesus. Th they can get a hold of our church. On the back of it, it says, Willow Park Baptist Church, Pastor Clark Bozier, 129 Ranch House Road. There's a phone number. There's a website. Hey, hey, I I'm going to challenge you. When you go out these doors, somebody's going to meet you here in a minute, and I want you to take that track and say, that guy's a member of my church, and hey, I want you to come to church with me next week. I'm going to challenge you to do it. Then we've got another one that, that Alan put together for us called Welcome Home, Finding Friendship, Purpose, and Truth. And it, it's got the gospel on the back of it just so they know how to be saved. Inside here, there's a beautiful picture of your pastor. Can I get an amen right Yes. <laughs> if they want to take that thing and frame it, come get me and I'll get you another one. I'm just, it's the way it works. But in here, here's about our church. Hey, they can, what is that called when you get on this, Alan? What is this called? Somebody tell me what that is. Don't yell at me like I'm retarded. I'm just asking a question. Amen. <laughs> a QR code. Is that right? Amen. Here's your QR code. You can put your phone on it. It'll tell you what's going to happen. It'll take you to our website. It'll tell you what's going to happen on Sunday mornings. Right here. Right here. Hey, this is my friend Tim Lee. He, he lost his legs in Vietnam. He's running from God. I want you to know you're going to heaven. Would you read that, please? Hey, hey, you're safe. I'd like for you to come to my church. I'd like you to come and sit with the people that I love on Sunday mornings. Would you do that? Would you bow your heads for just a second?